So our course is called Learning Creative Learning. Mm -hmm. So if we're going to be learning about creative learning, it's probably good to start by trying to think about what we mean by creative learning and, and why we think creative learning is so important. Uh, and at least as I think about it, I know that people think about learning and education in all sorts of different ways. You get lots of opinions and different points of view. But I think there's one thing that pretty much everybody can agree upon, and that's that the world is changing more quickly than ever before. Mm -hmm. So that what people learn today, a lot of it is going to be obsolete tomorrow. So if you think of today's children, that as they grow up, that they're going to be confronted with a whole stream of new and unexpected situations. So if they're really going to thrive in a rapidly changing world, they're really going to need to be able to come up with innovative solutions to unexpected situations. And for me, that's a big part of what creative learning is about, that success and happiness in the future is going to depend upon the ability to think and act creatively. Mm -hmm. And for me, one of the big problems is that most schools today you know, weren't designed to support kids developing as creative thinkers. And actually, most parents aren't really prepared or know how to support kids as creative thinkers. And of course, we see changes. There are a lot of schools now that are starting to adapt and think more about these issues. But overall, I think there's still not much understanding of how to help support people developing as creative thinkers. So I see that as like the big goal of this course is how to help people think about what are the strategies and approaches to support people developing as creative thinkers. And One thing that I'm really excited about is seeing when I'm looking at people introduce themselves on the learning creative for learning forums, seeing people from schools who are bringing in ideas about steam and making and, and tinkering. So I think that part of this process will really be people like us sharing it and learning also from how people are applying it within yeah. school. And getting a lot of examples, because I do think, yeah. but for me, I always learn about these new things by seeing concrete examples. It'll be great to have people learning from the whole community how people are starting to address these issues but, around the and, world. And when you say creative learning, because actually when I arrived here, I probably had a somewhat different uh, mental image of what creative meant. Mm -hmm. You know, I was thinking about watercolors and mm -hmm. colorful Lego bricks but not so much about creating. And then mm -hmm. kind of as I've learned about these ideas from you and kind of seen your work, I, I, to me what comes out very strongly is this idea of creating things. Yeah. Is that... Yeah, the, for me, I sort of see the ultimate goal is being able to think and act creatively to come up with innovative solutions. But then when I think about the process for doing that, it gets to exactly what you're saying, that if you want to develop as a creative thinker, the best way of doing it is have lots of opportunities to create. So to be experimenting with creating and being actively engaged in creating is probably one of the best ways to develop as a creative thinker that you can then apply to everything. And, and, and when you say um, kind of the times are changing or the world is changing yeah. you know, faster than ever and what we learn now is becoming obsolete, I yeah. think it's true for subject matter details essentially, like things you could look up on Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, like being a creative learner is becoming yeah. ever more important, yeah. right? And mm -hmm. and in a way, that's something that will not become obsolete. Yeah. It'll just it'll actually become more important as we as we go through life and we yeah. we're in different settings. We have to be adaptable yeah. and kind of keep learning. It's probably to differentiate between the content of learning and strategies for learning. That yeah. the content's going to come and go, but there's some core strategies that in will the be... whole process. Yeah. yeah. And I think those are things we hope to continue to think about in the course. And even though I do think it's more important now than ever before, on the other hand, I would hope that if the three of us were, you know, work on a course 100 years ago, that we still would have emphasized these things. Because I think these things are timeless, that we that were always important. And also just to grow up in a sort of, in a, you know, to be sort of, a, to have a full active you know, life, one should, you know, be an active mm -hmm. creator and have creative ways of engaging mm -hmm. with the world. So I think it's always been important, but it's maybe even more important now to really thrive in, in today's, today's world. Well, I guess the other thing, the fact that you saying work and life, and that was something in the this report that came out about 21st century learning skills. I was glad to see that they said work and life because sometimes people only focus on work. So I think it's interesting, again, exploring that how that helps you be a creative thinker and that whole process of creating within your own life as well as your work as part of that life. Yeah. I mean, as we've thought about this whole issue of creative learning over the past year, we started to 
try to come up with some framework for how we organize our thinking around it. And actually, it came out a lot of it came from our, you know, participation last year with the learning creative learning community as we interacted with the community and thought about it. I think that helped us evolve this sort of you know these four guiding principles or four cornerstones uh, for creative learning that we've talked about now that we've talked about in terms of projects, peers, passion, and play, the four P's of creative learning, we sometimes call them. So maybe it's good to, we can say a little bit about each of those four now, but these will be a continuing thread through the course and organizing principle, you know, for the, in the weeks ahead. So I'll start off with projects and then we can go around. So for me, when I think of projects, in me, it does connect strongly to this idea of creating that we were just discussing, that one thing that's important about projects is that you're designing and creating something when you work on a project, and it's something that extends over time. You start with an idea and turn it into a finished work, and a project could be all sorts of things. You might be building a you know, robot out of Lego bricks and, and computers, but you also might be you know, building a sand castle or writing a poem. You know, those are all projects that, that you're working on. You start with an idea and carry it through, share it with other people, get feedback from other people. And I do. Th I think it's nice to make a distinction between designing projects and problem solving. Because you do problem solving while you work on a project, but I find sometimes in certain education circles, they focus so much on problem solving. And again, it's hard to be against problem solving. It's good to be a good problem solver. <laughs> you know, you know, I sort of, you know, yes, I'm all in favor of problem solving. But sometimes if you focus just on problem solving, it becomes, sort of you know, disconnected from other things. You're just solving this problem in and of itself. And for me, I think we're gonna become best at problem solvers if we solve problems in the context of a meaningful project that we, you're working on. Mm -hmm. This time, I really learned a lot of this from my mentor, Seymour Papert, that he was always focused on getting kids engaged in you know, making things, constructing things. He called his approach constructionism. That was you know, building on Piaget's ideas of constructivism. You know, Piaget said that you know, that we actively build knowledge through our interaction with the world. And then Seymour said, well, the best way of building knowledge is by building things in the world. So this idea of making things, working on projects is the best way of continuing to build up new ideas. I think it's something that to me it seems there's a real cornerstone of becoming a creative thinker and that, that creative learning process, you know, creating is at the root of creativity and creative thinking and it's the root of projects. So it, well, I think one of the perceptions around projects is often that it has to be something in the physical world. Yeah. Like what is your, what are your, what's your thinking on this? Like what, what about people who are writing or yeah. who are working on, you know, developing uh, intellectual things? Yeah. yeah, for me, that's still a project. A project okay. is something that you start with an idea and continue to elaborate it, revise it, iterate it in collaboration with others, uh, and then to have something that's shareable at the end. Usually a project does have something that you're mm -hmm. creating, sharing, but the thing you're sharing could take all sorts of forms. It, in my mind, certainly doesn't have to be physical. We'll come back to later in the word sure. making. You know, There's a lot to talk these days about maker culture and maker community. Mm -hmm. uh, and for me, I also think make the most important thing aspects of making are not dependent upon the physical world. Mm -hmm. but don't get me wrong, there's lots of reasons the physical world is great and we should encourage more physical making, but it shouldn't be restricted to that. So He's already managed to offend the problem yeah. solvers <laughs> the and make, the makers. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay, but so projects are important, but it's not just projects alone. And also science, if you think of projects, sometimes, and also people think about the person working by themselves, focused yeah. on a project, and that's certainly not our vision of creative learning. So made the next guiding principle was peers, and yeah. which is something that's been really central to work you've yeah. been doing over the years. Absolutely, yeah. And, and actually my thinking on peers and why peers are important has changed quite a bit. Mm -hmm. When I started uh, together with my peers, I started peer-to-peer -peer university. Um, the initial thought was really more to get more people involved, like mm -hmm. to allow more people to legitimately participate because in a way the education system was set up that you had to wait for someone with authority a teacher or a professor or some expert who was then going to teach you and we like the web ethos that actually mm -hmm. everyone can now get involved and everyone can take ownership both of their own learning but also of teaching others and so we weren't even thinking so much about why that might be a good way to learn mm -hmm. but it was more kind of increasing legitimate participation originally and then kind of through that, the first rounds of courses ran. And one of the things that I found interesting was that 
you know, even though those courses had different topics, you know, there was a course on behavioral economics, there was a course on problem, uh, was it strategic thinking, not problem solving, <laughs> strategic thinking, um, and there was a course on uh, science fiction literature. They all had very different topics, but there seemed to be kind of a common uh, spirit to them, and people formed really strong relationships. And I started thinking about, well, what are the things that you learn that you, in, in a peer-to-peer -peer university course that you don't often learn in a, in a traditional course? And it's things like collaborating, because you have to negotiate what are my goals for this and understand what are other people's goals. Mm -hmm you also get more kind of invested in their progress. So you, you know, you start both learning from them, but also teaching them. And one of the things that was interesting is that often when you have to teach someone something, that's when it kind of the, it solidifies in your own head much more because you realize that there are other questions that they're asking that you hadn't asked before. And you kind of have to think about it from a different perspective. Um, so oh, and maybe the other thing was also, and this reminds me of when I taught my sister how to ride a bicycle. It's if you if you've just learned something, you're closer to the person who's learning it now, so you can empathize more. And if you're a master teacher, you can still do that. But I think that's a quality of the master teacher that they can empathize in that way. Uh, I always get empathize and emphasize. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> empathize, okay. <laughs> Um, and uh, but peers do that more naturally, yeah. right? Because they're kind of uh, closer to each other. And this is probably another area where, if we taught the course 100 years ago, I hope we also would have emphasized peer-to-peer -peer learning. But now there's sort of new dimensions to possibilities for peer-to-peer -peer learning. Yeah, right? yeah. I mean, now we can. You before you had to be in the same space, and uh, often if you needed someone who knew who could help you with the particular question you had. You know, you either were in a space that like a university would aggregate a lot of very smart people and then they could help each other. But now the, the Internet or the Web aggregates thousands of people. It's it's easy to find the help with whatever question you have, whatever problem you're you're faced with. You can find someone on the Internet who can, who can help you. And people are surprisingly generous. Also, I find mm -hmm. that they're willing to help. They enjoy, you know, learning together. Um, so I think those are some of the aspects of yeah. peer learning that that will be interesting to look at. So, so maybe we can go on to that we have projects and peers, but there's certain sort of ways that people get engaged mm -hmm. with the work that they're doing that, be, that connects with our ideas about passion. Yeah, so I've been interested in the ideas about passion, or I often talk about interest-based learning for a really long time, and I see it as a natural resource that motivates learning. Mm -hmm. And that was something that for example, for you mentioned your sister, seeing my younger brother where he wasn't really engaged in school, but he'd come home and he was so interested in music that it got him learning different instruments on his own, but then also starting to learn about electronics and eventually physics of sound and engineering and connecting with a lot of other people in terms of peers. So it was that strong interest that really motivated him. And with, we'll talk about the computer clubhouse, seeing young people with many different interests and having people there who can help them build on their interests really motivates learning. So it's something I'm really interested in. And although it's, you often see it, like for my brother and, and some of the young people after school, I'm really heartened again to see more schools bringing in this idea of passion or interest. And, and we say that in, often in terms of the research there's a critique right now that people often think of interest as an individual thing. And again, that where the peers come in and family and other people is that sharing of interest and seeing what other people are doing can really inspire you. And, and that was something Seymour Papert also talked about. One of the reasons I like he was saying how if you have a relationship with someone and they're interested in something, you have a relationship to that topic, even if you didn't before. So that whole idea that interest can be not just an individual thing, but seeing what people around you are interested in can also start engaging you. And it doesn't have to be like one area, and that's something that is interesting that's coming out in the online community too. Sometimes we're inter some of us are interested in a process or an idea or say helping someone. That can really be a motivation for a project. The other thing that I just want to say is that when in our work, when we're doing a workshop and I see someone who's not that motivated and then suddenly they get an idea and there's this spark yeah. of energy and again this natural resource is like 
and you can just see it in their face and their body language. They have an idea and then and they're motivated and that's going to take them through that process. And it, it helps you when you get frustrated, but you still have this idea that, OK, that may help you through. So anyway, I'm looking forward to talking more about those ideas. Yeah. yeah, I know that we've met a lot of young people in some of the after school settings we've worked in where in schools, their teachers had seen them as being, you know, you know, not getting engaged yeah. and sort of uh, having attention problems. And yet they'll work for like hours at a time on some of the projects as because they're working on they're deeply interested in. Yeah. And yeah, you know, but I think it's true for all of us. They were going to willing to work a lot harder and persist stronger, make deeper connections with the ideas if it's something that we're really deeply interested and passionate about. And yet we mean something very different from learning has to be hard, right? Because <laughs> yeah. a lot of people are talking about, oh, there has to be this effort and it's yeah. good. But like here we see people putting in a huge amount of effort, being really engaged. But I don't think I would think about it as being hard, kind yeah. of in the traditional sense. You know, yeah. It's challenging in a good yeah. way. It's kind yeah. of... But I, I have one question. Yeah. Like, there's this thing that I'm really interested in. I hope yeah. I hope in the week that we're talking about passion, we'll yeah. touch upon this, is like, how do people get interested in something? Yeah, yeah. Because it's like, you know, we're all curious. Yeah. Why, like, what are the barriers to then moving from curiosity to interest? Or is that, you know, how do those things work? And how can you inspire other people? Yeah, um, yeah. Some people, like, there's talk about a progression of interest. You know, I've been interested in the research and theory around it, but I think then putting it actually into practice and, like, it's not that easy. And I think <laughs> that we're, that's part of what interests me about it is it's not an easy subject. And mm -hmm. so I do think, because they talk about situational interest, you might be interested because everyone else is doing it, but then if it goes away, and how does it become a fully developed where you yourself are pursuing it because you're interested, you're seeking it out. So, I mean, and that's, I think, through stories, I think in our community, we can learn a lot by hearing how do people get interested in something, and then how did they either leave it or continue it, or what aspect of it continues on. Mm -hmm. So I think we can learn by hearing different people's stories, and I think not enough attention mm -hmm. has been put to that question. So maybe sort of to move on to the fourth piece, we had projects, peers, passion. And the fourth P that we have is play. Uh, and actually, I think this is also one that gets misunderstood yes. sometimes. Uh, but actually, there's a lot of talk these days about play in education. And, you know, well, let's, in, you know, uh, you know have, let kids have fun and we'll do sort of you know, have let them play games as a way of learning something. And that not all types of play are created equal. I think when we talk <laughs> about play, I think we think of a type of play. A creative equal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, and, you know, for, play involves a type of experimentation, of testing the boundaries, of trying new things, of taking risks. Uh, it's not just a matter of having fun. Uh, so, in fact, uh, you had mentioned things don't have to be hard. But, in fact, when you play at things, it's because you are working on something you're usually interested in. Mm -hmm. And you're willing to work hard at it Absolutely. because you're really caring about it. So you're willing to try new things and test the boundaries and, and experiment because it's something you care about and you work hard at it. You can Seymour Poppert sometimes used the phrase hard fun. I think he picked this up from an elementary school kid who <laughs> talked about having hard fun. And I think we want kids to have that to have hard fun where they really get engaged with it in a serious way. Um, I think our so play is not necessarily just an activity, but a whole approach to the process. Mm -hmm. That it's a way that you, to so sort of playfulness is probably maybe even more important than play. It's mm -hmm. a type of style in which you engage with problems and engage with situations. Uh, we sometimes talk about that style of engagement uh, with the word tinkering, especially when you're, you know, making things. If you work on a project, a playful approach to a project, we sometimes talk about how you tinker with things, meaning that you experiment, you try new things, you iterate based on what you find out. With, when something goes in an unexpected way, you investigate it and make revisions based on it. Mm -hmm. And we see that as a tinkering approach, and there's a lot of learning that goes on when you playfully tinker. And that's sort of an opposition to a more planning oriented approach where you investigate, analyze, come up with a strategy and execute it and you're done. Yeah. And that, it's not to say that, that's, that there are times when that can be useful as well. It's not one or the other, but I think sometimes people assume that that's the better way. Analyze, strategize, implement, you're done. Or right. like planning always has to come first, where right. we're often doing playing, tinkering first, and then you get the idea, you start planning, and then yeah. do it, right? And it goes back and forth. That yeah. You might sort of yeah. dive in and mess around, and then step back and say, well, where should I go next? And you're right, it is you know, back and forth between them. Um, 
But I think especially for, you know, especially for trying to engage people in that type of creative process and, you know, thinking about, you know, how to develop as creative thinkers, these ideas of projects, peers, passion and play uh, are ones that we see as our four cornerstones that I think we'll come back to in the course. Uh, but maybe I think as we've talked about it, we've also thought about even if you're paying attention to those four ideas, how is it that you put them into practice? I think Natalie had mentioned before, the real challenge is not just to understand these theoretically, but to put them into practice is what's yeah. hard. Um, and I think that's one thing we want to talk about more in the course this year is how to yeah. put these ideas into practice. At, at least one way that we've thought about that over the years is drawing upon our interest in kindergarten. We've mentioned earlier that we were inspired by the way children learn in kindergarten. And we've thought a lot about the process that kids use in kindergarten. And we think that process, we sometimes call it the creative learning spiral, mm -hmm. that could be useful for everybody in trying to bring that creative approach into practice. So here we, we, we're going to sort of play out this in the kindergarten style here. We have our creative learning spiral. Down, no, yeah, uh, no, I, think, I think it's, it's all right. uh, uh, yeah, maybe we should shift it around. Okay. It's this around. Okay. <laughs> oh, is it? Oh, but now, oh, no, we could down the other way. Oh, now, the, now, isn't right. it better the other way? You're right. Back, back down. <laughs> okay. So, we sort of start this spiral with imagining. It's like when I think of the, the, the kindergarten classroom, I think about, you know, kids come in and they say they have an image of a fantasy city that they want to build. But I think just having the idea is not enough. We always say that it's great to have ideas, but then you want to create something based on those ideas. So that's when we were talking about projects, we talked about the importance of creating something. Uh, so in the kindergarten, they might pull up blocks to start building a mm -hmm. skyscraper for their fantasy city. Uh, and as they work on their skyscraper, they'll start engaging with it in a playful way. They might sort of say, who can build the tallest skyscraper? Or they'll sort of experiment with different ways of you know, doing the architecture for their skyscraper. Uh, and then other kids might come along and they might start working together and sharing ideas. So maybe one person builds a building and someone else will make a road in front with cars and someone else will do some houses nearby or a shopping lot. They, they start building out the cities. They start collaborating, working with others. Then probably what happens in most kindergartens is at some point somebody's going to knock over the skyscraper and they'll start arguing. And that might be a good time that the teacher comes in and says, well, let's think about, you know, maybe you could have made a stronger tower and they'll start reflecting on how they might sort of make a, a better tower. And they might look at pictures of skyscrapers and the kids will notice that the skyscrapers are wider at the bottom than the top. Uh, and they'll get new ideas and start imagining a new way of building it. And it sort of continues around in the same spiral over and over, this iterative process that we talked about with projects. So in the best of kindergartens, we see this working, but it's not just for kindergarten. In fact, this is the way we work at the Media Lab. Mm -hmm. That I think yeah. as we've tried to make the Media Lab into a creative place, of course, the students here use different technologies. You know, they'll use microcontrollers and 3D printers, not just blocks and finger paint. But it's the same process of coming up with an idea, of, you know, creating a prototype, rapidly prototyping, experimenting with it, sharing it with the others, getting feedback from others, uh, reflecting on what you've learned, making a next prototype, and going through this iterative process. So in a way, with uh, learning creative learning, we're, we're kind of here. Yes. Right? Like imagine <laughs> last, last year's course, year. yes. Then, and then the, the nice thing was we shared it, and it, it turned out there were you know thousands of people all of a sudden giving <laughs> we got feedback, lots of feedback, comments, <laughs> yeah, ideas. Then we reflected on it, yeah. and now we're yeah. we're going through this yeah. again. Yeah, I, I, I did like it. Last year when we, I gave some presentation about our work and learn creative learning, and someone said, it's great, you're tinkering with MOOCs, you're tinkering with online courses. Yeah. So I'd sort of like that they said that because we were using our own style, that tinkering style yeah. for trying to see how can we try to change what online learning is about. Uh, so you know, I think this is something we see it working in the traditional kindergarten, although sometimes I get frustrated. I walk into a lot of kindergartens today and they're no yeah. longer doing yeah. it this way. That, that this is how kindergarten started a couple hundred years ago, uh, but it's kindergarten is becoming more like the rest of school and we want to do exactly the opposite, that we want to make the rest of school and the rest of life more like kindergarten by spreading 
this approach to learning. And I do think that's one of the ways that new technologies can play a role that, you know, in that kindergarten that blocks and finger paint are perfect for kindergarten because they're great for creating things. But also, as you build with them, you learn important kindergarten ideas about number and shape and size and color. But when you get to be 10 years old or 15 years old or 25 or 55 years old, that blocks and finger paint aren't enough. Uh, and I think that's why a lot of times education shifted to a different approach and they went to sort of lectures and worksheets. But I think we can't stick with the kindergarten approach if we just have the right materials and the right media, the right tools. So I think that's what we want to do is make the tools to extend the kindergarten approach you know, to, all, to all ages. Yeah, actually, I just uh, talked in Germany at a big congress yeah. of uh, the Association for Learning Sciences and I used, I talked a lot about kindergarten, I, obviously in Germany, and, I, and at the end of the talk, some people said, this is all too colorful. Like, this is yeah. all too colorful for me. I want to hear how this plays out in the, in the real education system. And I think there is this interesting tension as we're yeah. reimagining education. It's like, it doesn't all just have to be finger paint and colorful blocks. Yeah. Like, you can yeah. apply these ideas in many different settings. And I feel like the, that's the opportunity right now. Yeah. Uh, yeah, to, obviously serious things can come of this. Yeah. Although you can have a playful approach to having serious things that come out exactly. of it. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> so I think you know, over the course, I mean, all the things that we do in our group, but whether we've worked with the Lego company on robotics kits like Lego Mindstorms or the Scratch software that we'll be using in this class, it was all, I think, as we thought about it, we try always kept in mind how people might use it this way. How can we support each of these things? Mm -hmm. So either whether we're designing new tools like Scratch or robotics kits, or if we're designing new settings, like you mentioned, computer clubhouses or new classroom activities, I think we're always trying to think how can we support you know, each of these parts of the process and try to imagine... You and know, not necessarily sequentially, yeah, yes, right? Yeah, where yeah. we often are like tinkering might be where you get the idea. So, but it's still helpful to have it right. in this. You're right. Sometimes people can misinterpret this. Is yeah. yeah, it's not meant First to be linear. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Wait, yeah. you can't yeah. leave until yeah. you imagine something. Yeah. And again, that's where some people who imagine right away from talking brains. I mean, other people don't imagine until they start tinkering and yeah. then they get an idea. I, I actually feel like this often is a huge stumbling block mm -hmm. where like if you expect it to yeah. imagine something yeah. interesting, yeah. it's so hard. And if you start by just, yeah. you know, messing yeah. around a little bit, yeah. like in Mimi's book, uh, yeah. you know, you, you develop an idea yeah. or an interest. And you yeah. kind of, you or look at what yeah. other people have done. Yeah. Exactly. By seeing what yeah. others have done can spark your imagination. So I think yeah. I definitely yeah. will. And I hope this also then can serve as, as you said, we're on the second loop of us in developing the course. But I think even in the course this year, we can all think about going yeah, through this we'll multiple times. Yeah. And hopefully everyone who's involved can you know keep in mind as we work on each week, there'll be different activities and people can think about how we can sort of try to bring together all these elements. And it's not always easy but you know to bring in all these elements, but I think that's something we should try to keep in mind as we as we go through the course.